Hello, Mount Calvary, and welcome to your daily devotionals. I'm Victor Tim, and I am going to be with you this week. And we're continuing our walk uh, through Judges. If you remember, last time I, I left off, we left off with Gideon, uh, the chosen judge of Israel, defeating Midian, the forces that God had put over Israel to punish them for being unfaithful to them. And today we have the conclusion of Gideon's story. And we're going to have three parts to this. We're going to have Gideon saying this great theological truth. Uh, Gideon making something, Israel turning it into an idol. And then the conclusion of Gideon. Uh, but let's get into it. Let's start the, the, the story. Uh, we're picking up in Judges chapter 8 at verse 22. The men of Israel said to Gideon, You, then your son, and then your grandson must rule us. He rescued us from Midian. Gideon replied, I will not rule you, nor will my son. The Lord will rule you. Then Gideon said to them, Do me a favor. Each of you give me the earrings from your loot. Their enemies, the Ishmaelites, were, wore gold earrings. So there in the first couple of verses, right, we have Gideon saying this great truth. Rule us, Gideon, and then your son. Let's make you the king who who rules over Israel, and Gideon puts them back in their place. No, I'm not going to be your king. We already have our king. Our king is Yahweh, the Lord. The Lord is our ruler, our shepherd. Uh, he is the one who will be over us. Not me, not my son, not my grandson. Think of how much that takes to say as a selfish, broken human being who likes power and control. It's kind of like George Washington turning down being the monarch of America to be a president uh, for only a few years. Turning down power. Uh, but Gideon turns down power because he knows who the true king is, who is the true ruler of Israel. And then Gideon, he wants to commemorate this victory. And so we're going to see how he wants to commemorate this victory. Starting in verse 25. The men of Israel answered, Yes, we'll give them to you. So they spread out a coat. Each man took the earrings from his loot and dropped them on it. The gold earrings Gideon had asked for weighed about 40 pounds. This did not include the half-moon ornaments, the earrings, the purple claws worn by the kings of Midian, and the chains from their camels' necks. Then Gideon used the gold to make an idol and placed it in his hometown, Orphra. All Israel chased after it there as though it were a prostitute. It became a trap for Gideon and his family. I'm going to take you back there to uh, to uh, verse, tra verse number 27. That word idol, then Gideon used the gold to make an idol. It's not really an idol, it's an ephod. An ephod. If you go back to Exodus chapter 28, uh, beginning in verse 6, uh, we can see here what the ephod is. Make the effort out of fine linen, yarn, creative work, gold, violet, purple, and bright red yarn into the fabric. It will have the two shoulder straps attached at the top so that it can be fastened. Make the belt that is attached to the ephod out of the same fabric. Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel in birth order. Six of their names on one stone and the remaining six on the other. Engrave the names of the sons of Israel on the two stones the same way your jeweler engraves a signet ring. Mount them in gold settings and fasten them on the shoulder straps of the ephod as reminders of who the Israelites are. In this way, Aaron will carry their names on his shoulder as a reminder in the Lord's presence. Make gold settings and two chains of pure gold, twisted like ropes, and fasten these chains to the settings. So to celebrate the victory that God had handed over to Israelites, Gideon wants to celebrate. He wants to celebrate by making a new ephod, a new priestly garment. And so this is going to be one made of 40 pounds of gold, a magnificent tribute to the victory that God had given him and given his people. And yet, before Gideon even dies, the people of Israel are so sinful, are so broken, they turn this effort, they turn this, this priestly garment into an idol. And they begin to come to it like it is a prostitute. They begin to turn the gift, the, the, gift, the, 
the monument to the victory God has given them. They have turned the thing that's supposed to point them to God into an idol. Before Gideon's even dead. I love how it finishes there. It becomes a trap for Gideon and his family. What's supposed to point the people to God becomes their God. And then this last section, Gideon's kind of uh, conclusion. Beginning in verse 28. The power of Midian was crushed by the people of Israel, and Midian never again became a threat. So the land had peace for 40 years in Gideon's life. Jerubabel, son of Joash, went home to live. If you remember, that's his other name. Gideon had 70 sons because he had many wives. His concubine at Shechem also gave birth to a son. The son was named Abimelech. Gideon, son of Joash, died at very old age. He was buried in the tomb of his father, Joash, at Ophrah, the city belonging to Abiezer's family. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel chased after other gods, the Baals, as though they were prostitutes. They made Baal birth their god. The Israelites did not remember the Lord their god, who had rescued them from all the enemies around them. And they were not kind to the family of Jubabel. Again, that's Gideon, despite all the good he had done for Israel. Forty years, and now they are completely chasing after this Baal. They're chasing after the false gods. They, they only continue down the track that they began as soon as Gideon made that effort. You know, we as humans, we have this terrible tendency to break that first commandment. You shall have no other gods. It sounds simple. It sounds easy. You ask a child, they think they're, they're doing okay. I don't worship any other god. But we do. The first commandment is an issue that we all struggle with. And we turn things, anything, into gods. Things that are supposed to point us to God become our gods. Money, how God works in our life, how he sustains us, that becomes our God. But it's really there to remind, it can point us to who he, get, who he is. And yet that becomes our God. We even see this in some church bodies where the pastor, the one who's supposed to proclaim God's word, becomes the God of the congregation. That pastor is untouchable and and the people bow down to them because they think, they they act as if they are the God when in fact they are only the messenger. We see this all over the place. We have this innate ability to turn things into idols. Even things that God has given us to point us back to Him. So I encourage you as you go this week, Just think about that. What in your life might you have too strong an attachment to? What in your life points you to God, but sometimes you focus on it rather than the true Heavenly Father who has given you that gift? Have a great day, Mount Calvary. See you tomorrow.